right away as soon as you're in. So can you give us an example of some of the policies that you would start putting forward now that you have backing on this first day? As the, I mean, I'll tell you what I've been doing for the last year and a half, and that'll probably give you a pretty fair sense, and I'll pass it to Dom. Right now we have what I consider, uh, what, well, Peter Russell, Professor Emeritus of Political Science at the University of Toronto, comes with this term, false majority. It's a false majority with a minority of the public across campus can elect the majority of the members of parliament. So I'm not gonna mislead you to suggest that you know, elect us and we'll be able to change the tech system or redress, you know, the, the, what, what an effective opposition needs to do is, I think, is revitalize democracy by making sure Canadians know what's going on in the House of Commons. That's one thing, because our mainstream media ignores a lot of very important issues, and I find that one of the most important things I've been doing as a member of Parliament is being very transparent about what I'm working on and why it matters, and engaging Canadians to help me. So a very good example, I mean, I've done this on the omnibus budget bills, I've done this on a number of pieces of legislation where, by myself, I've drawn attention to an issue way before any of the other opposition parties were paying attention. On the case of the Canada-China investment treaty, to give a good example of how one MP who's really committed to being a voice for the people who elected me works with the general public and, and outreach to uh, uh, activist organizations. On the Canada-China investment treaty, not only did I first identify it as a threat, analyze it, read it, get it out there, do press conferences, but gradually got, and I had also backing from a number of international law experts in investment law, but at the point that I was putting out petitions and asking Canadians to help me, I also persuaded some of the NGOs to, to help. So we had 70,000 names on petitions online that I could go in the House of Commons and say, this was before I could get the other parties to pay attention. 70,000 Canadians are urging this treaty not to be ratified. It's still not ratified. Now, it could be ratified any day, so I always say that with my fingers crossed, but the ability of an MP to work on what's being presented, to analyze it, and I also presented uh, 330 amendments to Bill C-38 last spring, so I, was, I actually ended up organizing all of the parties in opposition into what the media across the country said it was the first effective opposition in the House of Commons to anything Stephen Harper had done since 2006 the first effective opposition. And it isn't because there's a, a lot of me, there's, there's one of me, uh, but the, the difference, and it's not because I'm cleverer than all the other MPs, that's not the case. There's some very, there are totally wonderful MPs in all the other parties, for sure. But they're constrained by a top-down system that controls them and says, as Donald was saying, it's all about 2015. So with, when I was desperately trying to get attention to the omnibus budget bill back last spring, C-38, the number one issue that the NDP were raising was that Conrad Black was being allowed back into Canada and was his right. They had some whiz kid, some spin doctor somewhere, who said, this will help us get good numbers in the polls. But it wasn't substantively what we should have been working on. And in the same way, when I was trying to get attention to the Canada-China Investment Treaty, and you know, the first response, in the period when I was working on that, the other parties got their the biggest issue, and it's an important issue, I'm not denigrating it, but it isn't the only thing, and there wasn't much we could do about it in the House, was the XL beef scandal and the E. coli. So day after day after day, when I'm trying to get people's attention on a treaty that's, that's sitting in the House of Commons that we have an option to get to debate, and I couldn't get the other parties to help, because, so they're going on other things. So it's not so much that I could say that there are policy issues. I'm always raising climate change. I'm making sure we don't ignore important issues. But we don't have the power, and neither does Tom Mulcair, and neither does Bob Ray, in, in a majority conservative parliament, to actually put forward laws that we want to get passed. Although I do think my private members bill is going to pass. It's more about how do we ensure that Canadians from coast to coast see what's happening, engage on it, and try to change things in the moment right now. And I think we're doing that pretty effectively on a bunch of issues. So I'll pass the ball for it. Obviously, I can see it as everything I did times two, but it is. <laughs> you, you asked what, uh, what we'll push for. I think much of what we're going to be doing is push back in the sense that the government is presenting stuff and we are actually going to have to uh, communicate to the public about what's going on and tell people what our objections to it are. So that currently, uh, Bill C-45, this falls uh, on the budget bill that's going through, 
Elizabeth has been working very effectively on the provisions, the parts of it that deal with uh, navigable waters protection, that basically our, our protection of, of waterways in Canada is being covered. But that's, that's a clear issue. There's 400 pages to this bill. We've been working through it together. And there's aspects of this that haven't gained media attention that are really important. For example, every tourist who comes to Canada is going to, before getting on a plane now, have to uh, fill in an electronic authorization. If you're on a no-fly list, you're not going to be able to come to Canada. If you have an illness, then the minister will have discretion to uh, keep you out of the country. If you have a misdemeanor against you, every single tourist, even from those countries where you don't need a visa at present, is going to be stopped getting into, into the country. The effect on our tourist industry is going to be enormous, but this is part of a general process of dealing with uh, a xenophobic process, outsiders who may be a threat to us. So basically that has to be exposed. There's another bill going through, coming through uh, Parliament dealing with uh, police regulation. Nobody really has heard about that one yet. The RCMP, uh, we know, has been involved in harassment. The government has, of its own members, as well as uh, issues relating to uh, the relationship between uh, the RCMP and, and the public. Uh, the Canadian Civil Liberties Association has taken a stand against this. And because of my connections with them, I know what the stand is. I'm able to argue about that within, within Parliament. Um, so in terms of the legislation, that is going through Parliament now, none of the other candidates in this election are actually addressing these questions. But we've been working on it. We know what the issues are. Uh, the other thing that I think that, uh, that we have to know is, and the thing that we will be pushing for for the next two years, is that currently, believe it or not, Mr. Harper has still got 36% approval across the country. That with Justin Trudeau coming out to, uh, as, a, as a leader, the NDP is falling in the polls and the Liberals are going up in the polls. Even if we do think like the other parties about 2015, there is an enormous danger of the Harper Conservatives winning the 2015 election while the other two parties split the opposition vote. That is a real, real danger at the moment. For the next two and a half years, we are going to be emphasizing our policy of electoral cooperation agreements. We need to get opposition parties to form an alliance to orchestrate the downfall of the government. That's what opposition attempts to do. Each of the big parties is so interested in winning, they think they can win it alone, that they've been turning down our open offer of uh, some cooperation, even at the by-election by level, but particularly in future, in future uh, situations. We have to get them on side to form a united alliance against this government, otherwise the government will win. How do we do that? Well, you actually have to stick a firework under their backside. What is that firework? The firework is you voting for a Green Party member to show them that even the safest seat is not going to be winnable for them. If we can motivate them to take us seriously, which we can do by voting in a Green Party member, then we will have alliances, ad hoc cooperation agreements that will bring down the, uh, the, the Harper uh, administration. Any other questions? Yes. Hi. Um, I was wondering if you could uh, explain your position on fracking and uh, the affecting communities such as Fort Washington. So the question was, I don't know if everyone heard across the room, was to explain our position on fracking and particularly how it's affecting Fort Nelson First Nation. Well, if one thing that lets you know how where we stand on that is that uh, Chief Charlene uh, Wildman of the Fort Nelson First Nation is coming tonight to speak at our gathering. I don't know if you know, I didn't mention this earlier, we might still have some spots. I don't know at the Bank Victoria Conference Center, David Suzuki and Donald and me and Andrew Weaver and Ken Wu and Chief Charlene Wattman. And Dan And Dan Mangan. Uh, at the convention. And, and if you can't get in, we're, we're live streaming it. But um, yeah, in any case, we're the only uh, party that federally and provincially opposed fracking. And that's because when you examine the, da the damage to the water, water uh, purity and groundwater through the toxicity of the chemicals that are used in fracking, 
I mean, I never thought I'd, I mean, I've been doing environmental work for the last 40 years. I never thought I'd see a technology that included earthquakes as a side effect. I mean, people would still say, okay, but it's fine, really, because we need it. Uh, so fracking is something that, and the other thing, Andrew Weaver's research has shown uh, that although natural gas, when it's conventional natural gas, has always been considered a pretty good option as a transition fuel as we get off the heavier carbon fossil fuels, obviously coal being the worst, and then crude and oil, and natural gas is, relatively speaking, a pretty green fuel, but not if it's fracked. Unconventional natural gas has a huge greenhouse gas component to it because upstream, the process of getting it out of shale is enormously energy intensive. So we oppose fracking, and we also, you know, very concerned about the fact that, that British Columbia provincially is hitching its wagon to it. And this does create, you know, it's, it's, it needs to be discussed. And, and <coughs> Yeah, are there any uh, environmental studies students here? Then you'll know Kara Shaw. And my first uh, um, reaction when I heard of fracking in Northern British Columbia is to contact Kara. I mean, who's going to know better than the future chair of environmental studies? And basically the question is, is this a good transition to a low carbon uh, economy? Is this a good transition uh, energy source? And of course, Immediately, she sent me back two of her papers and said, no. I mean, that's the, that's, and, and this is, these are peer-reviewed papers from Oxford University. Uh, the, the statistics, are, the data is there. It's just, you know, have to know the right people <coughs> to supply it. And basically, that was good enough for me to say, you cannot possibly support this if the, without having further data on the actual impact that it's going to cause. So we are quite against fracking and fracking pipelines on the Pacific Trail Pipeline. Yeah, so, yeah, uh, you know, if, if no one minds, I'll go, do you have a question there? Okay, and then I'll come back to you because you have a report. Yeah? So the Enbridge Pipeline um, is supposed to go through my hometown, and I'm wondering what steps could you make for people to stop the Probably the most important thing I'm doing right now is trying to stop the China-Canada Investment Treaty. Um, now that may seem like I've just changed the subject, but if anyone isn't aware of why those two things are linked, uh, there's already uh, money from state-owned enterprises of China in Enbridge's project to this point. And there's interest in PetroChina in building the pipeline, by the way. Uh, and if you look at the business pages of the Globe and Mail, they'll say, well, PetroChina is a very competitive bidder because their labor costs are lower. Guess why that is? Because then we're looking at temporary foreign workers programs for building the pipeline. So we have the pro and bridge side, although it's pretty small in British Columbia, telling us it will create jobs, but not necessarily jobs for Canadians. Uh, the reason that I think, you know, of all, we've been doing many things to oppose the Enbridge project, uh, the call for a legislative moratorium, consistently taking apart the arguments that are being used by those who say we have to have it, uh, I mean, there's so many arguments you can find them on my website. Actually, I turned my constituency newsletter, um, two newsletters back, into a briefing document for people in my riding on pipelines and tankers and why we need an energy strategy and the fact that we don't have any critics, we have no shortage of pipelines to meet the capacity of the oil sands at the moment. Unless we go to a 150% increase in output from the oil sands, we don't need any additional pipeline capacity for the shipping of that product to export markets. So th there's a whole lot of false assumptions in Mr. Harper's standing, well, his are not false assumptions, but false assertions, and other people then accept them as false assumptions. But his claim that this is of a national interest has never been subjected to any kind of cost-benefit analysis at all. But because there is already investment from state-owned enterprises of China, if we let the Canada-China Investment Treaty be ratified, we could find ourselves in a situation where when we say no, and British Columbians definitely want to say no to this project overwhelmingly, we could face an international arbitration suit brought by the People's Republic of China against Canada seeking damages. And we don't know how much they would claim, but it could become, yet, and I'm very concerned it would be, a uh, very strong pressure to say, we well, can't say no now or you'll have to pay the People's Republic of China X billion dollars. So to protect our ability as a sovereign nation to make our own energy choices and to bring back the environmental laws that they destroyed last spring in C-38 that they're destroying now in C-45. And by the way, the next bill, Mr. Harper, 
plans to bring before the House of the Environmental Law to ramp up the Species at Risk Act. Uh, that's undergoing a significant overhaul. They plan to take it in Bill, bill C-45, this, this falls under this bill, but it wasn't ready in time. Yeah. Bringing back those laws, saying no to Enbridge, will be compromised if this Canada-China Investment Treaty is allowed to be ratified, and that's why I'm still, I say that's my number one thing right now, is, is to push against that as hard as we can. Okay. Uh, you, uh, you and then there. I just have a follow up to the fracking question yeah. and also with um, the pipeline and other energy. If we don't want to use fracking and that kind of financial gap as a transition, then what are you guys proposing to do? Because we are going to have to transition somehow and it is going to take time and work and effort. So, what is your plan then instead of fracking? Well, I think you have to start, and as you got a sense from what Donald said earlier about how his approach to fracking is based on evidence. Green Party is not an ideologically grounded party. We're actually based on the evidence and we're pretty pragmatic. As it happens, when you look at Canada's energy use, one of the things that's striking is that we waste more energy than we use in this country. So the inefficiency with which we're using the energy we have is the it's sort of the low-hanging fruit on the spectrum of choices that one can make about energy policy. Uh, you know, the obvious thing is not to go to fracking or oil sands and, in other words, unconventional ways of obtaining fossil fuels, if you're looking at what's your, what are your energy choices as a society, if you're wasting more energy than you use, the first thing is to maximize the energy efficiency of your transportation, built infrastructure. About a third of the greenhouse gases in Canada come from buildings. Institutions like UBIC have a very hard time because the last thing the president and the board are looking at for when, you're, when you've got a tight budget is can we retrofit the whole build the whole university campus so that we go off the grid? You could, the technology is there, but the funds aren't there. So going to energy efficiency in transportation, heating, lighting, and cooling could actually substantially reduce. I mean, we could do twice as much uh, with half as much energy being used, in theory, and the technology is there to do it. At the same time, we need to do to the transition first place I, the, the Green Party policy focuses on, it, it doesn't apply to British Columbia, but a lot of Canadian provinces are burning coal for electricity. And in fact, up till now, I mean, I know they have goals for expansion in the oil sands, but at current levels of emissions from the oil sands in Alberta, there's more greenhouse gases coming from the coal-fired electricity plants operated by TransAlta in Alberta than there are from their oil sands. So we want to have a sensible plan for transition. My, you know, the, the metaphor that always comes to mind for me in terms of what's going on with why are we going to fracking or tar sands, it's a lot, it's an addiction problem. Right? It's, not, it's not actually an economic problem or a technological problem. We're, as George Bush once said, <laughs> addicted to oil, addicted to fossil fuels. And you know when, you, when you've got an addiction problem, when, when the strong, I always think about, you know, if you've got really good champagne or you've got some really good Merlot, and that's all gone. And at some point, if you've got a real addiction problem, the rubbing alcohol looks okay. <laughs> and, and, and that's the difference between where we were with conventional natural gas or conventional crude and going to scraping up bitumen and processing it with steam. I mean, the whole, the whole concept that these things are really commercial viable options is the desperation of the addict. You know, so we need to transition off fossil fuels and not, not go crazy to try to squeeze the last bit out of the most remote, difficult, unconventional, and expensive ways to get energy. But the Green Party, by the way, we have a complete strategy on just about everything, findable on our website under policy, greenparty.ca, front homepage, go to policy, and click on Vision Green, and our policies on healthcare, our policies on foreign policies, our policies on trade deals, and our policy for a sustainable energy future, creating more jobs, and all that's all on the website. So, then to you, sir. I was just wondering, this one's actually really valid. What is your view on the role of the government in shutting the power of publicly traded corporations with Canada, not only within our nations, but also abroad, um, considering Canada says, you know, it's not our place to make sure that these companies are holding up international human rights laws outside our borders, but yet, we'll facilitate an area where you come in on our exchange markets that's a very tricky question, right? I mean, we're, we're into, we're into uh, big, big issues here. Maybe the best way to answer it is to say,
say, well, what is actually the current policy of the, of the government at the moment? And I think you can say two things about it. One is it's not transparent. We don't know what it is. Uh, and secondly, whatever it is, it involves a lot of discretion. In other words, we have a large amount of, of uh, unregulated regulation, if you like. The, it's, uh, the, the source of the authority is within cabinet, and we really don't know what they're doing. Now, clearly, in, whether we're dealing with South America, whether we're dealing with Africa, whether we're dealing with, uh, with how Canadian companies trade overseas or operate overseas, or uh, overseas companies uh, taking over in Canada, we need to know. We need to have a discussion about these matters. It has to be fully above board. I think if, we, if uh, you raise the human rights issues and, and those issues, these are matters of serious discussion, I think. Uh, principle tells us that you don't, you don't want to, uh, to have dealings, particularly with states who are human rights abusers. Pragmatism tells you that might not actually be possible in every circumstance. So what you're doing, what, what you have in those circumstances is principle pushing you one way, other factors pushing you the other. There has to be an open public debate on such matters. If we're ever going to uh, deny our principles, even to a small amount, it has to be defended. It has to be justified absolutely clearly so that we know what we're doing. And that's clearly not happening at, at the moment. I just one little add-on is there was a private members bill put forward by John McKay in the previous parliament with the Liberals that would have called for Canadian mining companies to have to observe human rights um, to Canadian standards when they operate abroad. Unfortunately, it wasn't supported enough by the Liberal Party to pass, uh, and there's another version of it coming forward now. It's a tricky issue, extraterritorial um, obligations on Canadian corporations, but we have begun to see, at least in one little area, a, 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 an, an opening to say that we're going to hold Canadians responsible for what they do that's illegal under Canadian law when it's done outside of Canada. And that's in the case of sex tourism. We're prepared to hold individuals accountable for, uh, for the abuse of essentially children in developing countries through sex exploitation. That, at least in principle, opens up the possibility for extraterritorial application of Canadian human rights laws in the case of mining industries. It's at least possible, and that's one place where I hope to keep working on that private member's bill in the house. And next question, I, 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 oh yeah, sure. I just want to add to that, that uh, I was asked the other day what, what change I would make to the Charter of Rights uh, in relation, to if, if, I had, if I had the option to do so, making it ex clearly extraterritorial would be the biggest change, because then any Canadian government action overseas that is illegal, whether we're talking about torture in Afghanistan or mining, uh, Canadian companies uh, uh, abusing workers overseas, if we could actually bring our standards there, that would change. That would change the world. Do you have a follow up? Um, yeah, just for me. Um, what do you believe the role is of the government within our own nation as far as creating norms? Because we have these companies again that are trading, and then if they want to push a norm, you know, they go to their broker and say, we want to give you 20 percent off on your stock, and we need 10 million bucks. So we're you know, on the Canadians that need their money, um, and then they come out and really take advantage of the media, convince us all that it's a norm because we're not all into private arms. Um, it's not profitable right. as a citizen. Um, so what do you see the role of government as? unifying us against these super powerful corporations um, to get our voices heard. You know, I think in a, in, when, when, we, when we're dealing with globalization, the, the gap between the public and the private has begun to disappear. And I think that that's what you're alluding to, that in fact uh, there is this uh, concentration of power in non-governmental so sources that actually can't be ignored anymore. Uh, and they're not subject to the same administrative and constitutional norms. Uh, but of course, if we do take sovereignty seriously, and that's part of what we are saying is, is our platform here. We believe in democracy. You know, I think if whatever the other opposition party calls itself, we, I think, identify ourselves as the true Democrat in terms of building a public law uh, which demands that governments actually not delegate power to the private authorities. Uh, 
uh, without actually offering justification for doing so, and that if there is a delegation of power to the private authority, it becomes public, and then it becomes subject to our public our public norms. We have to accept that uh, that point of view. Way back there. Yeah. Um, I was wondering, a lot of the time when I'm talking to uh, my peers or things like that, they often say, well, my boss is not going to do anything, and like, uh, they're just kind of, they're not very impressed with the system that, that's happening right now, and a lot of bosses need to have and shift and um, legislation being pushed through because people are aware of the amount of money and things like that. Um, what do you suggest to people in those cases of the Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I said, well, obviously, <laughs> every vote does count. Now, in some ridings, it doesn't feel like that. But when you consider that in the 2011 election, the difference between Stephen Harper having another minority parliament and having a majority of conservative seats was in 14 different ridings, a cumulative total of just around 6,000 votes. In other words, for the whole of Canada, I won by 7,000 plus votes in San Francisco Island. So for the whole of Canada, in 14 ridings, a cumulative total, I mean, some ridings people won by, set one riding with 17 votes, one riding with 100 votes, terribly close margins. You never know on voting day whether you're in a riding that's going to have a close margin or not. Savage Club Islands, everyone thought was going to be much closer than it was, and I won by a big chunk, but nobody knows that, uh, before voting day. So every vote does really count, and, it, and when the largest block of voters in 2011 and in 2008 were the people who stayed home. So if even half of those people had felt, what the hell, I'm gonna go vote. I don't like Stephen Harper, so I'll pick any of the others. Harper wouldn't have had a minority majority government right now. And since the policies that I believe Stephen Harper is advancing are the most damaging to your generation above all else. Pension rules are different for you. I mean, all the rules, Jim Fire just says, you know, well, suck it up. Things, life changes, right? So there's gonna be two tiers. People who are my age and older are gonna get better pension benefits and people who are younger aren't. My age and older are gonna die before the worst events of climate crisis hit us. Not for you. I, so the, the, the reality of the, the highest proportion of that group that stayed home was people under 30. And the most damage that gets done by this particular brand of politics is the people under 30. I hope we can convince a lot of people. So what does the Green Party do about it? One is, I don't blame people for being disgusted with politics. The way most politi politicians behave is disgusting. But it's not really who they are. They are, even to the point of heckling, is, is instructed. Okay? In the House of Commons, every vote, every day, Every MP except me gets a sheet of paper that tells them how to vote. Every day, every vote. It blew my mind, actually, the first time I realized that it wasn't just some votes where it was whipped. It was every vote. And I, and I, I think it'll be, it's really critical for the health of democracy that MPs actually read the legislation for themselves, consider whether it's in the interest of their voters, and be prepared to vote themselves on principle. And when we have a larger caucus, that can demonstrate to other MPs, look, it's possible. That's how Westminster Parliamentary Democracy is supposed to work. If you check our Constitution, there's no reference in our Constitution to the existence of political parties. It's an add-on. Sir Johnny MacDonald used to refer to his caucus as a loose fish because they moved around on different issues. You didn't know they were gonna vote. I mean, Stephen Harper has his caucus good and nailed down. There's no loose fish there. Uh, at, but, so it's a combination of sharing the news that every citizen has power and your vote is powerful, and at the same time, creating the kind, behaving in a way that will earn the respect of the people who are disgusted to believe there's a reason to vote. So it's two things at the same time, and we really need your help. If we prove it out here in Victoria, we're gonna see a lot of change across the country. So, John. Nobody could have been more disillusioned than me when I went to uh, Lafayette Parliament in March and testified before a committee. I think that you've probably heard that when uh, uh, Stephen Harper took power, he issued a directive to his caucus that basically identified the ways in which they could 
obstruct committee uh, proceedings from working. Basically, his, uh, his line when he was in minority was uh, how to bring the institutions of government down. And he has been successful. Uh, when I, in March last, I, uh, I was called to testify before a committee, and it was, uh, it was amazingly disillusioned because not only was my time being hacked once I got there because of some little- Eight minutes before. Eight, yeah, I was flown across the country to testify for eight minutes. They cut it to four minutes after a little squabble between the chair and an opposition member took too long. I gave my testimony and then I, in past years when I've done this, you're subject to questioning, you're, you're subject to rigorous questioning like this. This time, uh, what happened was that uh, all the MPs took out their sheets and started talking about their party's line on the, uh, on the bill, which was you know, just very, very surface analysis. No questions about what I, what I testified about. The institutions of parliament, the, the traditional institutions have been killed. There's no question about that. But the interesting thing that I've learned is that the politics goes on outside of these institutions and nobody does it better than Elizabeth. This, when we talk about uh, forming cross-party agreements and having um, caucuses that debate issues like the climate caucus that are outside any formal circumstances, it's just like belonging to UVic, which you know has uh, institutions that don't work. They're also fluid, they're flexible. And if you've got people who are not intimidated by institutional structures, but recognize that they all are malleable and can be worked into new shapes, then you've got MPs that actually can get on with some business. And part of the business, I think, is, as I said earlier, to get opposition parties to recognize that they're falling into the trap that's been created by Harvard, that they're, uh, that they're bickering, that the, the rancor that goes on there, that they're actually playing the wrong chess move by doing that, that the right chess move is actually working cooperatively amongst themselves to actually get work done. So I, at, at some stage, you know, I've had to hit rock bottom before realizing, wait a minute, this is not, when we talk about parliament, we're not talking about uh, something that can't be manipulated. I mean, politics is all about the manipulation of institutions to make them work, but it takes energy to make them work, and it takes independent thinking to make them work. And that's what I'm suggesting that I can bring that other, other candidates in this election Any other questions? I know some of you, oh, some of you had to leave, and obviously if, if you have to go to classes and stuff, I just keep want to want to continually thank everybody for being here. We do have literature on that table over there. But uh, go into your question in the back. I just want to ask if you could uh, I did not mention the hashtag. Thank you for raising that. We're using a hashtag for, for especially starting with tonight's event for the rest of the week, which is hashtag go Galloway for YYJ. So please, if you're wanting to help us out, attach that to your tweets. That would be awesome. So it's go Galloway for YYJ. Uh, in terms of your party cooperation, it's interesting. Nathan Cullen did make it his uh, calling card, essentially running for NDP leadership, and his very successful run coming in uh, so close to the top with that was really because so many people were attracted to the idea of cooperation. I mean, I worked with Nathan a lot, and right now his view is that uh, he didn't win leadership, so that idea is off the table. And we're, we're on, and Tom Mulcair won leadership, and he's not interested in that cooperation model. The kinds of things that I can envision are, you know, a wide spectrum, a broad spectrum, but they start with the premise that we have to get the Liberals and the NDP to talk to each other. That's pretty much where I'm starting. I, and I experience it every day as an opposition member, member of parliament and in the opposition lobby, sharing the space, but having such a hard time getting the Liberals and the NDP to talk to each other. If we could get to that before 2015, which I think the electing Donald here will have a really good impact in making that happen, what are the ranges of things that can happen? Well, one of the most effective things of electoral cooperation that I've ever heard of is something the public didn't even know happened, which was in the 1998 election where Joe Clark was running in Calgary Center as a progressive conservative and the threat was reform. 
And at the same time, uh, Anne McClellan, the liberal, was running in Edmonton. And the liberals and the progressive conservatives made a pact, which, as I said, I didn't know. And the NDP helped out too. In Calgary Center, all the progressive voters voted, worked for Joe Clark. Now, there was still a liberal candidate on the ballot in Calgary Center. There was an NDP candidate on the ballot in Calgary Center. But they all pulled hard to elect Joe Clark. And in Edmonton, the reverse was done. The progressive conservatives at Edmonton worked to elect, and the NDP at Edmonton worked to elect Anne McClellan to block the reformer from winning. That is the least visible form of cooperation, leaving all the candidates, uh, all the parties having their candidates on the ballot anyway. And I think a lot of, you know, there's, there's talk about Nathan's model, for those who don't know, was to have shared nomination meetings, and whoever won the nomination among the Liberals, the NDP, or the Greens would go forward. Whatever method is chosen, and it has to be through discussion with the liberal leadership, and we don't know who will be liberal leader. Obviously, Justin Trudeau has an early lead, but there are a lot of candidates out there, and their voting system, I don't quite understand how the liberals are picking their leader this time. But there's a liberal leader in the future. Certainly, there's Tom Mulcair at his greens. We need to sit down and talk to each other and figure out what will work. And for the, I'm supported in this by a resolution of the Green Party um, membership at our convention, which has been approved by the members, well, it's actually gone out for approval. But it says, we will work for cooperation with all the parties in the next election with this goal, not of us you know, gaining power, but of getting rid of first past the post, so that we will make any bargains that are necessary with liberals and new Democrats on a one-time basis for one election with the commitment from them that when the election is over, we bring in some form or other of proportional representation so that Canadian voters have the same ability that voters do in every other modern democracy around the world. It's only the US, the UK, and Canada that use first past the post. Well, you throw in Zimbabwe as a modern democracy, we'll throw them into. But most nations around the world use some form or other of proportional representation and those voters know that they can go out and vote Green, or they can vote Social Democrat, or they can vote you know, whatever, and they know their vote is absolutely going to count because of the PR system. It's only first past the post that leaves people with this empty feeling or this panic that they have to vote for someone they don't like much because someone they like less might get in and send the person they don't like much. It's not a good voting system. I think part of the reason that voter turnout goes down is that people, you know, if, if going and voting makes you feel sick, you're not likely to want to go do it again and again. You have to vote in a way that makes you feel fantastic. Like when you go and vote on Monday for Donald Gowing, put the X next to his name, you're going to feel so good. It's not to mention the warm fuzzies the next day. So, any other questions? Well, Anybody? Yes, yeah, absolutely. Just, just to add to that, I think our view is that we negotiate. And when you're negotiating, you actually don't tell the people that you're negotiating with what your favorite strategy is, uh, because then you might actually not get it. Um, but what you do before you negotiate is ask other people, what do you want? What do you think? What do you think I should be pushing for? Let's have some, a number of options out there on the table. Uh, Nathan Cullen's I felt was a very good one. And I think that that could be put back on the, back on the table again. But the whole point is, it's ad hoc. It's it's one off, and this will be for the for the 19 for the, the 2015 election. Uh, what can we actually get them to do? Is sometimes you're going to have to compromise on that, and we would like to keep in touch with the electorate, knowing that that's what we're going to be trying to do, so we can get the best ideas in there. Well, there's only one kind of proportional representation that does that, and that's pure PR, 
elsewhere, and that's only at this point Israel and Italy that have systems that will represent parties no matter how small their level of public support is. So if you look at, for instance, if you were to look at the same funding formula that we had under the per vote support that was brought in by Jean Chrétien in 2006, 2004, uh, 2004 rather. Now Stephen Harper's killed that, but the threshold for a political party receiving the per vote support was chosen at 2%. That doesn't sound like much, but there's no party um, that made that cut other than the Green Party, the Bloc, the Liberals, the NDP, and the Conservatives. So even if 2% is your cutoff, you're not going to get in Libertarians, you're not going to get in, I mean, as much as they're good people, Canada Action Party. Yeah, to get 2% of the vote is a lot, actually. So you can, there, there's, there's ST, there's single transferable vote, there's different varieties of proportional representation to mixed member uh, proportional. Uh, you can, I think my, my, and our policy of Greens is that we don't actually have a first choice for what kind of PR works best. We want to take that up to Canadians and we want a process that engages the public in it. Uh, my favorite model was the path from first past the post to PR comes from the experience in New Zealand where they had a, a royal commission that traveled the country and heard evidence from low people. I'd love to see a royal commission on democracy that looked at the unhealthy degree of power of the prime minister's office, how to control that, the lack of each member of parliament having uh, the ability to, to do the, to, to actually fulfill their job and work for their constituents. Uh, we need to, you know, what's called the democracy deficit, how do we fix that? There are a number, and I'd also like to take on board how we make sure our elections aren't manipulated by robocalls. But an actual examination of democracy would be healthy. And one piece of it could be, what kind of voting system do you think works best for Canada? We brought Stéphane Dion to the Green Party Convention in Sydney this summer. He has a new idea, nobody, even in his own party, they don't support PR yet. But his idea would be one that he thinks would work better for Canada than the existing ones used around the world. But we don't need to go the route of pure PR where every single party is going to have a shot at getting an MP in the House. I think a 2% cutoff is pretty fair. But that's just my view, and as I said, the Green Party as a whole wants to hear from Canadians before we take a seat. Just looking, oh, you want to talk about so There's one more question. There's two more questions. Pardon. I just want to add a little one. We've got a, a uh, institution of government at the moment that's completely useless, namely in Senate. Uh, and it's, or I can't say it's completely useless, but we don't know what to do with it because it is unrepresented. It's filled with patronage appointments, and we know that that is deeply problematic. If we again look for positive aspects to, to troublesome institutions, we can use the Senate as an experiment for, pe for proportional representation. This is a no-lose situation. Let's try it with this organization that clearly isn't working and find out whether our, our favorite proportional representation system actually works. If it doesn't, no, nothing lost. Let's move on to another one. In other words, we can uh, we can play around with our institutions in that way. So here's your question. Um, I just wanted to go back to Canada or China investment treaty really quickly. So where it stands right now is pretty much any treaty, for those who were paying close attention, was it was tabled on September 26, but with no press release, no fanfare or nothing. I don't know what would have happened if I hadn't been there that day paying a lot of attention. And it was put forward on the order paper for 21 sitting days, but without any opportunity for a debate or a vote. It could have been put forward to a debate or the, a vote at the option of the Liberals and the New Democrats, but they didn't do it. So when the 21 sitting days were over, at that point, Stephen Harper has the ability through what's called the order in council, to, which is basically a cabinet decision, but since he controls cabinet, uh, pretty much at any time, it can be ratified. So it's very nerve-wracking. We're doing everything we can to stop it. So you might wonder, what kind of things can I be doing to stop it? Well, I've been, been uh, doing, I've spoken to every provincial premier's office. Uh, they, I was urging them to go to court on constitutional grounds, not to allow, because a decision of a municipality or a province can also give rise to an arbitration challenge by China. But the arbitration challenge is to the government of Canada, 
so that the province and the municipalities aren't parties to the arbitration, but if their damages are paid out, Stephen Harper has said he'll put in place a mechanism to get that money back from the province. So I've been speaking to premiers. I'm only hoping that since they haven't gone to court, some of them are actually saying through the through channels to the federal government, don't ratify this, we don't like this, you haven't consulted with us enough. They're certainly not saying anything publicly, so I don't know. I also know that I've been working with a lot of conservative members of parliament who don't like the treaty either, and I'm hoping they're putting up a good fight behind closed doors. But again, that's not something that, that they feel comfortable sharing with me. And, and, but I do know there's a lot of unhappy conservative members of parliament who were never briefed on this treaty, who didn't know it was coming up, and who there was no technical briefing offered by the Minister of Trade for MPs who were interested. I had to work to get one because I wanted to make sure that my analysis was correct when I walked through it. But it took me about a month to get officials from the Department of Trade to sit down with me. And so that I could, and I invited some conservative MP friends of mine to come to the briefing because it was the only one that we got. So at any time it could happen, but I think it's really important that we stop it. And I know that when Mr. Mulcair was in Victoria, just to add one point in case you've heard this, he said, don't worry, I'll rip it up when I become prime minister. And, but, you, but you can't rip up a treaty. No prime minister in history in this country has ever ripped up a treaty. Uh, Stephen Harper, as awful as it is, he did withdraw from Kyoto, but we're not officially withdrawn yet because he used a legal mechanism within the Kyoto Protocol that gives a one-year written notice that we, that we will withdraw from the Kyoto Protocol under terms that are made available in the Kyoto Protocol. So by mid-December, if we don't somehow get them to change their mind and withdraw the letter, we'll be officially withdrawn from Kyoto. That's, that's quite a different thing from saying we'll rip up the treaty. What Mr. Harper's done under Kyoto, by the way, is the first time that a prime minister in the history of this country has withdrawn from a legal binding treaty that we had ratified. What Mr. Mulcair says he'll do in terms of ripping it up has never been done, and it won't, it's not possible under the treaty, so we'd have China going to an international arbitration to sue us for damages for claiming we ripped up the treaty. It, it, it's not easy to get out of this thing. It's, under, it's, it's got a term, I didn't cover this yet, the first term of the treaty is 15 years, and then it's automatically renewed for another 15 years unless a future government wants to give a one-year written notice to get out of it, and if the one-year written notice to get out of it is given, from that point forward, any existing investments from the People's Republic of China are protected for a further 15 years under the terms of the treaty we've just gotten out of. So the effect of this thing being ratified is, according to Professor Gus Van Harten at Oslo Law, it's a 31-year lock-in for all intents and purposes. So we really don't want it ratified. Uh, oh, you want to ask me? Yeah. Just a little revision. I don't know if you saw last uh, week that the Donor Commission did a survey of uh, the donors, the 7,000 uh, donors who give the most money to the Conservative Party, and asked them what they thought about the treaty. And I think about two thirds of them were aghast that, uh, or, or had objections to it. I think that uh, um, there was definite negativity. And that's a very positive sign because you know that this party is not going to go anywhere where it's going to lose the monetary support. And brilliant of them to actually think about surveying uh, uh, where, the, where the backing is. Good question. All right, so my question is, it's related, it's a lot different from all the other questions that are being posed. So um, it's not a pragmatic, more like an ideological question. So seeing political college right now, and this is the body as well, going this way, you create really, really interesting courses my knowledge. So my question was we in political college we've looked at so many different types of solutions. And like I guess for me I believe like the solution like the solution is a diversity of solutions. So so far we've kind of talked about like policies and laws and regulation and how to change the government. But I feel like um, more and more when I'm kind of talking to people on environmental things, I feel like a big thing is like our separation from nature is just the fact that like we're outside less, we're talking to people in our community less, we're not learning as many skills. Like I just feel um, we're just not we're not caring about the natural world as much, or like we feel like we're separated because we're driven by profit. So my question is like, do you have any action items on like how to get people to start harvesting our respect for nature? Like it's pretty like yeah, well uh, if if you look at Fish and Green, we have we have a lot in there about the need for environmental education, for also 
you know, I've written a lot of this about, that I like the turn of phrase, major deficit disorder. Yeah. We, we, we definitely need to create more opportunities for Canadians to experience being, you know, in nature. But in, in terms of what you do in Parliament, it, I, I think it's, there, that particular mental map of understanding ecosystems can also be applied to how societies and economies are organized. So if we realize that, in, and it was, it was one of John Muir's great lines from, John Muir was the founder of the Sierra Club in 1892, when they said, you know, um, as soon as you get, get, uh, get hold of anything in the universe, you find it's hitched on to everything else. So in the same way that when I look at complex issues like the climate crisis, I realize it's symptomatic of other things. And the good news is if we were to get to root causes, we'd solve more than one problem at a time. So it's what uh, Jane Jacobs called the opposite of, of vicious cycles, being virtuous circles. If you start fixing one thing, other things start getting fixed. So for instance, if we were looking at greenhouse gas issues, and one of the things in our policies is promotion of walking school buses. Um, I don't know if you've heard about walking school buses, but the idea being that if people are really worried that their kids can't walk to school by themselves because we're increasingly afraid of random acts of crime and violence against our children walking to school, the walking school bus concept says, okay, we're going to have reliable parents who lead a group of kids who all walk to school together. And if you're doing a walking school bus, you also might want to incorporate into that some naturalist education along the way. We know the name of that tree, you know the name of that tree. I mean, we do know that kids today can identify something crazy like um, 10,000 different logos of different companies. Maybe it's not 10,000, but can identify four or five different tree species. They'll know a tree from a bush, but they won't know a maple from an elm, from an oak, from a, you know, from a Gary Oak. So there's, it's a, it's, your question is great and really difficult to give a succinct answer. All I can say is that we're the only party that recognizes that there are limits to growth, that on a finite planet we can't have an, an unexamined assumption that our goal is unlimited economic growth. We have to recognize that the ecosystem and a healthy ecosystem and a healthy biosphere is our primary goal because if we fail to have that, nothing else we're doing is going to matter. So it, it's at the level of provincial jurisdiction around schools. That's one thing as I, you know, I speak as a federal politician. I know that when I talk about wanting more environmental education, that's a provincial matter. And all you can do is say, how do we have the policies that say, Let's work together provincially, federally, municipally to create the healthiest possible society. But again, looking at what are the side effects of being increasingly an indoor sedentary childhood, diabetes, heart disease, uh, and also I think a deep sense of alienation and, and often a lack of self worth in the context of not knowing where you are in the universe. And that, you know, so, you know, healthy kids running around and, and uh, stomping in the mud the way far ago it was when he was a little kid and David Suzuki was when he was a little kid, grow up very differently from kids who are playing video games all day. So, but that's not a federal issue for which I can pass a bill. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, did anyone else have another question? Yes? Uh, with regards to Harper and the uh, Arctic issue, what is, what is, what is your, your viewpoint on maintaining our sovereignty over areas that are not necessarily in the Arctic border line and maintaining uh, environmental and water restrictions. Yeah, it's interesting how Stephen Harper has, through his annual summer trip, tried to brand himself as a prime minister who cares about the Arctic while ignoring the fact that it's melting. It's a really interesting um, irony to me, anyway. Um, and we published a lot on the Arctic right now. The Arctic Council. We've seen a very significant and negative thing just happen where Russia, which of course is a, a partner in the Arctic Council, has deregistered the indigenous group from Russia that had a right to participate on that council. So I've reached out to my colleagues in green parties around the world so that the Norwegian Greens, the Finnish Greens, the Swedish Greens, we all put out a joint statement condemning Russia for expelling its indigenous group. But putting that to one side, the Arctic Council is a very important mechanism Stephen Harper has tended to denigrate it and prefer uh, those countries that have Arctic adjacency and not the Arctic Council, which has a, a permanent observer status for, for instance, the Inuit Circumpolar Conference. Uh, 
we need to have arctic strategies that are about climate crisis, that are about Inuit food security, that are about um, basic safety for vessels traversing our Arctic with climate change. We are seeing an ice-free uh, Northwest Passage, and Rick and Morty had a cruise ship go up there, right? It's not properly mapped. They could run aground. If cruise ships are going through the Arctic and run aground, could we have the ability to rescue people? No, we don't. You know, there's a lot of basic infrastructure for security that's lacking. And Stephen Harper's made a ton of announcements about uh, deep water ports and new icebreakers, and there hasn't been movement on these. Meanwhile, he's closed the world's leading Arctic Research Lab, the Polar Environmental Arctic Research Lab on Eureka, at Eureka on Ellesmere Island, which they just put $10 million worth of new equipment into it like three years ago. It's the only lab that close to the North Pole anywhere on the planet, and we're shutting it down. So uh, I don't think Stephen Harper's actually standing for Arctic sovereignty. He is, however, flexing muscles about Arctic militarism, which is responding to a problem that doesn't exist with solutions that don't help. Yeah, I'm not sure I understand the question. Is, oh. it, is it saber rattling that you're concerned about? With, yeah, with, I, was, you know, I was wondering what your because the, the thing that I was going to the counter position I was going to put is that in the Arctic there are other initiatives, uh, international and transnational initiatives that are very cooperative that we actually should be paying attention to. Health issues, for example, uh, there's the Circumpolar Health Institute. Uh, there are uh, Aboriginal groups. Uh, in the north are forming alliances and points of view. It's, it's Harper's sort of idea that sovereignty only means um, national militaristic sovereignty that is the problem. Because there's a lot of positive, there's a lot of positive work being done, uh, educationally, health-wise, uh, culture-wise in the, in the Arctic. We just don't hear about it. As well as the research. We, I mean, there seems to be the Canadian position is now two things. One is militarism, and secondly, exploration for oil and gas. That, does that catch what you were looking for? Oh, good. Any other questions? Yes, sir. I mean, I mentioned that you weren't that much of an ideological party, but more of an evidence and science based party, and I'm wondering if Paul Thornhill is really calling himself a science candidate or taking a stance against the billion dollar pollution act that makes you cry about it. Well, in the same way that I, uh, I contacted uh, Kara Shaw, who identified as the leading expert for uh, fracking, I did exactly the same with Tom Peterson, who is here, and uh, sat down with him for an hour and a half, as well as having this email interchange, in order to find out actually what the science said. And it's interesting because uh, the, the point of view that he wants to come out with is we've got a window of opportunity here uh, that we can actually uh, delay because he draws the distinction between contaminants going into the ocean and pollutants. Now the contaminants are there, we know that it's there, but we're actually not monitoring them at the moment to find out how much harm that they're doing. We're talking about the heavy metals, the, the, um, uh, the petrochemicals, the, the pharmaceuticals that are going through the sewage system. We recognize that they're there, we just don't recognize what the level of harm is, and therefore you can't build a economic and social policy relating to sewage without, without that science. So his suggestion is, instead of actually building a $781 million um, solution to a problem that may not exist, let's find out exactly what the level of the problem is in order that we actually can, be, can build a better solution. And I think that the Green Party's position uh, takes that science seriously. Of course we want, if this is an expanding city, of course we want to think about where the puck is going to be down the line. We want to think about an adequate sewage treatment, not for today, but for tomorrow. We should be thinking about the expanded city. We should be thinking about what that will look like. I think that the, the liberal candidate is basically saying, no, 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 we don't need it, we don't, we never will need it, which I don't think is what the scientists are actually saying. The scientists are saying we have to do much more monitoring to find out how much damage is being done. 
They're also saying, if we were really interested about the stewardship of the, uh, of the wonderful of trade at the moment, we would be pouring money into other issues, such as uh, the marshes, such as uh, the habitat of, of animals. We would be protected, where we know we are doing great, a great amount of damage. So the issue in environmental care, basically they are saying, let's actually get our priorities right. $781 million could be put to much better use. But I think our point of view is, let's recognize that sewage is going to be a bigger, as we become more urban, it's going to become a bigger and bigger problem. That we actually have to think about how to solve that problem. And interestingly, as well as contacting the scientists, we have both been contacting the CRD. And we're saying, you know, what really is the roadblock here in relation to uh, the project? We know that there is a huge amount of, of antagonism toward, towards it. Can you actually find a solution to this? And of course, the answer we got is, is A, if we knew that DMD could give us land near um, uh, Victoria, we wouldn't have to think about pumping our sewage up to Heartland and have this incredibly inefficient system, a very costly system, of getting the, the solid sewage up there, which they are really concerned about. That is not an aspect of this, of this proposal that they want to live with, but they feel constrained. Secondly, uh, there's an idea that uh, the Department of Fisheries regulations requires us to actually act immediately. But there actually hasn't been any recent uh, inquiry with the Department of Fisheries about how, uh, how rigorous their, their demands actually are, or whether they would grant exemptions. So our point of view is put another, put another green MP into, uh, into Parliament, and one of the first things to be done is to go to these departments of government and actually say, how flexible are you? And if there's two of us doing it, they will actually listen much more carefully. That is a regional problem at that stage. But it seems that none of the other candidates are actually recognizing that there's a federal role to be played to actually bring the government on place. Don't take away this money until we actually figure out other solutions that are available to this problem. And I think that that's the, that's the both the scientific, the, the, eco, the economic, the social, the political, and the legal solution all built into one, which I think that we have, uh, I, I just don't see the other candidates as matching at all. Well, it's, it's also too complicated for them to understand, and therefore they diss it immediately. Yeah. yeah, no, a nuanced position is hard in an election campaign, but you know, we've always felt that you know, there's a need for sewage treatment, but exactly when would it kick in? And, and just to, to further elaborate what Don was saying, there's no point, the difference between contaminants and pollutants. What we basically are finding is that there, the, the organic material is not, as far as we can see, causing the problem. It's the contaminants within the sewage, the heavy metals. And we know that, oh, that we've had some success in recent years, too, in controlling its source. So the efforts, for instance, to get dentists not to put mercury down the drain, stopping uh, auto body shops from putting contaminants down the drain is actually leading in, in measurement to less heavy metal contamination at the outflow point than in 1995 when some of the first researching was done. So it's, it's, it's complicated to say, yeah, we need sewage treatment, but number one, the CRD plan doesn't currently include a chosen technology but the choice that they've made to pump the sewage to Hartland because they can't get space uh, from, uh, the obvious source would be from the uh, Esquimalt Naval Base area to get four acres there. If they could get that, we have a broader choice, a broader range of resource recovery options for the plant. And we, I actually still think we should be pursuing decentralized options that create more opportunities. So it's, uh, but I don't want to see the federal money disappear. So as a federal MP, I've got a mandate, and Don has a mandate, that we want to talk to DND, talk to BFO, and talk to Environment Canada so we get the very best possible, best technology that's looking towards the future growth of Victoria, and we don't think the current plan cuts it. So that's kind of not Murray Rankin's position and not Paul Somerville's position. And I, I don't know, Dale can change his position, so I'm not quite sure where he's at on it. But I think a federal MP can play a constructive problem-solving role, uh, not, you know, divisive. And I think that, that some of the other policies have proven to be pretty divisive in the campaign. 
No, no, I think, I think that's right. I mean, I think that it's, it's, it's very strange to be in a campaign where one of the candidates is saying, I have a single issue here. And basically, that's the metaphor for everything. And that's a, you know, if I said, you know, my position on Kinder Morgan is, that's what I'm running on, uh, I think you'd think that was a little bit nuts. And so it's very, very hard to, to explain uh, that, in fact, the issue might be quite complicated. It has different dimensions to it. And of course, if you are running on one issue, you want to, you, you're inclined to say that nobody else has got it right. And I think, I think our position is perhaps more subtle, but it identifies that there are legal questions, economic questions, political questions, and scientific questions. And we're actually trying to, uh, to as, as Elizabeth said, solve all four problems at once. Any other questions? Yeah. Oh, yeah, sure. How do you address the inefficiency of uh, coalitions within countries that do practice forceful representation? How would you address uh, if you had issues that you were raised by the country? Well, <laughs> green parties around the world have been in coalition government a lot, so we have a lot of experience with it. And I think the evidence is that a coalition government, for instance, New Zealand, oh, now they have a conservative government. There was a chunk of time when New Zealand had about eight years of a coalition. And in that time, we went through successive elections every year and a half. So it, it's every system is going to have its pluses and minuses. But to have a coalition government system work uh, has had a, a pretty good track record in countries around the world. We've been in, the Green Party has been in co a very long-standing coalition in Germany in which the Minister of Foreign Affairs uh, was a, a Green Party member who had uh, Jochen Fischer, who had tremendous international credibility. We worked with coalition governments uh, in uh, uh, Sweden and Norway and Denmark, and currently in Finland, the Finnish Minister of Environment is a Green Party member. So I guess I would say that within the Canadian context, our experience with coalitions has certainly been much less the case. But the, the country's founding in 1867 was called the Grand Coalition, and Sir John and Donald Desire were bringing different parts of the country and different parties together. We've had, we had coalitions that oversaw the Second World War. We wanted to make sure that we were all on the same side and working together. And probably the most fertile period in terms, certainly in terms of creating the, the social safety net for Canada, the most fertile period of the federal parliament for a lot of the uh, social justice measures that we take for granted now, such as health care, such as employment insurance, such as pensions, and all of that was done under Lester Pearson when he had a minority government, but an effective, it wasn't a formal coalition, but he had an effective working relationship with the NDP that kept his, his party in power. So we have some experiences of coalitions, and they're not, they're not uh, lacking for positive characteristics. I think, you know, the worst period of Canada's history and sort of the worst experience for respect for informed public policy and evidence-based decision-making is what Stephen Harper's doing right now with a false majority in tearing apart laws, not just the environmental laws passed by Brian Mulroney, but environmental laws passed by Sir John A. Macdonald. He's tearing apart the fabric of every single piece of environmental legislation. It's, he hasn't touched the Canadian Environmental Protection Act yet, but everything else is being, is being ripped up Without a mandate to do that, there was never any discussion in the election campaign. It, you can't find it in the conservative. If, if you got even with a minority of public support, if it had been in the platform, I plan to dismantle the Fisheries Act and take out protection of habitat. I plan to say that only 62 rivers in Canada are navigable rivers anymore, and cross out the tens of thousands that are currently protected. I don't think you could have gotten elected on that platform, even with a minority of the vote. So. I'm more worried about false majorities than I am about coalitions. I think I, I'd add to that. When you think about coalition governments that fail, you, you also think about Italy and when, uh, when scare tactics are being used by uh, politicians in Canada about coalitions. It's these, it's these countries that are drawn out that, are, that seem to have uh, 50, 50 governments since uh, in 50 years or even less. Um, the successful ones, I think, are, are there, and we should actually study why they work. But the, other, the other thing I want to say is when we're talking about alliances and the impact of um, green members of parliament, uh, they need not be involved in coalitions. Uh, 
the idea from a, um, a very formal alliance is uh, just one way of, of interacting in a, uh, in a uh, cooperative way. And the example that I would use is look what's happening in Australia this year, where uh, in July, a package of 12 uh, clean energy bills was passed by the government thanks to a very strong uh, policy creation by the Greens in Australia. They were identified as having uh, some gravitas, having some clout, and were able to actually push for alternative energy packages, uh, push for a carbon pricing system, push for an equitable taxing system that goes around this. I mean, it's an incredibly exhaustive uh, uh, set of legislation dealing with new technologies and new, new sources of energy. It's brilliant, and we are just being left behind. And we're being left behind because I think that voice just isn't being expressed in policy. Just, just check. Oh, yeah, we're almost, we're almost out of time. But this, I don't want to cut anything off unless anyone has any other questions anyone has? Oh, we've got two, we've got two. So we're doing you and then you, and then we'll both ask, we'll ask you both together if that's okay. Um, I'm And in your question? Oh, you mentioned an event in the Yeah. It's tonight at 7 o'clock at the Victoria Conference Center. I can't guarantee seats, but I bet if you showed up, we could find a way. I bet we could. I bet we could. Because we've got, we do have a lot of ticket holders confirmed, but if you were, if you were willing to take a chance, that's all I can say. It is being live stream. It's also live stream. It's David Suzuki, and uh, it's hosted by Donald Galloway and Emma Weaver. And it includes Ken Wu as a speaker and Chief Charlie Wildman and Dan Mangan's music at the beginning and at the end and David Suzuki and who am I forgetting? I'm forgetting someone who's going to Kill Ben. So it's going to be great. Oh, well, I know Adam Creek, Olympic medalist from Beijing. So it's going to be a really cool program for Greens. And yes, food security is in our policies. We, we want to have. And if I could just give it a, a quick and use food security as an example for how Greens approach these issues. This is a shared jurisdictional area, right? Most of agricultural policy is provincial, but there's a federal department of agriculture. And increasingly, I'd say across the country, federally and provincially, food policy has been hijacked by big agribusiness. So that the car bills, the Monsanto's of the world are determining what Canadian food policy looks like, Canadian agricultural policy. What we want to do, and we would do it in food, we do it in transport, we do it in energy, these are all areas where Canada has no national strategy, is figure out what are our goals nationally, not federally, what are our goals nationally, and then how do we get coherence where the municipal, provincial, and federal government levels are all working together in the same direction. We know that, I mean, certainly across the country, there's a tremendous movement for local food. People want to know that their food is safe, they also want to support their local farmers. Uh, it's huge here on Vancouver Island. So a policy that, for instance, and it's all written out in Vision Green, a policy that, for instance, encouraged that we negotiate with big grocery store chains that a certain amount of their grocery store shelf food would be made available for essentially local farmers. The reason that they prefer to sign, even when they're doing organic, they prefer to sign a big contract with one big producer in California than buy locally. It's just for the ease of doing the business, the transactional cost of dealing with 40 or 50 local farmers in each store <laughs> across the country. They just don't want the hassle. But we could negotiate those goals and maintain them provincially and federally and municipally. And we could do the same thing in terms of transportation policy, cultural policy. Canada, it's, it's, we're really unusual within the OECD that we don't have strategies in any of these areas. Other countries do. So, yeah, we're very committed around food security, and we're the only party right, oh, that's not true, we've lost in a lot of business, but we've been the party that has been doing the most about the GMO issue and getting GMO labeling. Right now, the only way you know something doesn't have genetically modified organisms in it is if you buy certified organic, and that will let you know that you don't have genetically modified organisms. So I'm just going to turn it over to Donald to give you a few more words. I just make sure, please, spread the word to your friends. If you possibly can, regardless of how you feel you might want to vote, it really is important that UVic uh, students are voting in this election. 
as a by-election, it doesn't get the same level of publicity because it snows as if we were in a general election, but it's a really unique and powerful opportunity because you don't have to worry about who's going to be forming government. The only thing you can think about is who do I want representing me between now and 2015? And the prospect of actually changing Canadian politics across the country, really sending a message about pipelines and tankers and fracking and open pen fish farms and all the things that we know people in Victoria really care about, a green vote and a green MP is a clearer message and really will rock the system more than anything else you can do. So I'm just gonna pass it to Donald and thank you for coming. I think I you know, want to second everything that Elizabeth has said, and I also want to add one thing. I am used to dealing with social organizations. I have a deep respect for civil society, for the, the, the link between the MP and the individual should not actually be mediated by a party structure, which is completely unrepresented, but actually by social organizations who are the saints of our society, the ones who, for free, pro bono, actually look after the interests of people in, within the, the electorate. I think that what we have uh, in, our, uh, in our social and political system is a, uh, a structure in which the individual can have direct connection with an MP, but more often works to the MP through, through using social movements, social organizations, the people that I'm used to dealing with. And my ability to actually deal one-on-one -on -one with individuals, but also deal with these representative groups, I think places me very well to act as the spokesperson within, uh, within Parliament. And that's, that's the pitch that I want to give, to give you. But I have the experience of working not just in Parliament, but actually working with the exceptional social movements who push our causes, who push our politics forward. Government uh, or political parties tend not to do that. And I think, except for this one, uh, which uh, of course is unique. But I also want to say that my big concern is that people know that they can vote. And within UVIC, I think there is a large degree of ignorance. People really think that because their home away from UVIC is in another jurisdiction that they actually I'm talking to law students, very sophisticated law students, uh, over the weeks, I'm just, just discovering they think they can't vote here. Uh, you can vote here if you are within the boundaries of the writing, and you were resident here on the day the election was called, and you are resident here the day the election is, is, is to take place on the 26th. All you have to do is come along with a piece of ID that is government issued and shows your, shows your actual address in Victoria or a bill. You can even come along with somebody who will vouch for you as a resident, and they'll accept that. But it's really important to get word out to people who think, who assume they can vote, that they actually can. We could actually build up a very, very strong electorate within UVic. But it turns out, particularly in by-elections, students can not to vote. And they don't do it because they see it as being worthless, they tend to do it for the wrong reason. Now, Evan, I think, do you want to, to yeah. make some comments about that? Just really quickly, I put together a sheet here. Um, and if you guys know that you're voting green and you wanted to help out in the last week, there is a space to tick that you're interested in volunteering. Uh, if you're not interested in volunteering, there's still a space on here to say, I want some help finding out where to vote. And there's a place to put your postal code and email. So if you wanted me to send you an email with exactly where you can go either today to vote or where you can go next Monday to vote on actually election day. I'd be happy to do that. I just need your email and your postal code, and that'll just be on that table covered in the green card set. So. I, also, I, was, I was negligent not thanking Emma Strait and Nathan and the Young Greens at UVic for organizing today. I'm really grateful for the chance. And, and I really appreciate all of you staying so long and having such excellent questions. So please pick up literature, sign up if you possibly can, and spread the word to get out the vote, because can you imagine how cool it will be? November 27th, front page headlines everywhere. Second Green MP elected representing Victoria. Yes, so please, we need your help, and thanks a lot for coming.